Hello and welcome to St. Matthew Lutheran Church of Milwaukee. This is the service for December 8th, 2024, the second Sunday of Advent. We sing the Advent hymn on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist cry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
you and also with you let us pray stir up our hearts O Lord to prepare the way for your only son by his coming give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world through your son Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading for the second Sunday in Advent is from the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing Psalm 66. <laughs> to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name, make his praise glorious. Praise our God, all peoples. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Let all the earth sing out our Savior's praise. Cry out to God with joy. Come and 
and hear all you who fear here God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Let all the earth sing out our Saviour's The second reading is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. These are the verses for the sermon, which has the theme, Lord, give us Christ-corrected vision. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We acclaim the gospel. The Gospel is recorded by St. Luke, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etruria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, 
and all people will see God's salvation. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing, O gracious Lord, with love draw near. mercy and peace are yours in Christ Jesus, who was and is and is to come. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ Jesus, a little riddle to begin with today. What do 12 million adult Americans need but not have? The answer is something to correct their vision. Most adults need corrective lenses of some kind, and most have them. Whether it be their nearsightedness or their farsightedness or their astigmatism, there is technology out there to fix that and help us greatly with our vision. So what are you waiting for, you other 12 million. 
What great progress we have made since about 800 years ago when some unknown Italian ground the first lenses of the first eyeglasses. Since then, of course, much better eyeglasses, eventually contact lenses, now the laser surgeries that can correct our vision. What a gift of God to have so many ways to have our physical vision so much improved. But of course, what a far greater gift of God to have our spiritual vision improved. The Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, famously lost his sight entirely when the Lord Jesus called him and he fell to the ground. Three days later, something like scales fell from his eyes and he could see again and he was baptized. He not only went from physical blindness to physical sight again, more importantly, he went from spiritual blindness to spiritual sight. He went to the eyes of faith. Christ Jesus himself had corrected his vision. And we see that on display in everything he writes, including these verses from his letter to the Philippians. And we want to see things the same way with our vision also corrected. So we say, Lord, give us Christ corrected vision so we can be farsighted and so we can be nearsighted. In the world of physical vision, farsightedness is one of those conditions to be corrected. And it gets a little confusing because when we say farsighted, that means we can see far just fine, so we have to correct the other side of things. But for our purposes today, we're talking about seeing much farther than any eye chart or road sign. A very basic way that we need to have our vision corrected, that we need to be far-sighted, is that we're not looking far ahead enough into the future. By nature, by the way we're born, by so many of our day-to-day -day experiences, we only really see this world and this life that we are living at the moment. And we go so far as to put starting dates and ending dates of our lives on the granite and the bronze of tombstones. We go so far as to make legal notices of when someone's life has ended. And it's too easy to see that as the end of everything for us, the day we die here on earth. We say, Lord, give us the Christ-corrected vision which sees beyond the grave. Christ-corrected vision, which does not fear that day of our death or the day of judgment. As we heard in those verses from Malachi, who can stand on that day, this day, this last day, the day of the earth's destruction? Well, God tells us we can stand on that day righteous and pure and ready for judgment. Paul says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We are assured that we can stand on that day far into the future or maybe later today. We can stand there because we're standing in God's grace. Not standing before him with our track record of good things done, bad things avoided, but standing before him with our sins paid for, which with Jesus' own righteousness covering us. And Paul says, whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, 
all of you share in God's grace with me. At different times, the Apostle Paul was in physical, actual chains and captivity. He didn't mind it so much because Christ had corrected his vision to be far-sighted. He knew that these chains were temporary. He knew they were only part of his brief earthly existence. It can help us when Christ corrects our vision to realize that anything that holds us down, that drags us down now, it's only temporary. We can see all kinds of conditions the way the Apostle Paul saw his momentary imprisonment. We can see them as something that won't last. Chronic illness, ongoing emotional struggles, difficult personal relationships. Lord, correct our vision so that we realize that these are all temporary. Help us be farsighted and look down the road. And along the way, help us not just be confident, but help us to be conscientious. Something that the Apostle Paul instructs us to do reminds me of part of a physical eye exam. Most of us have had those, and if you have had one, You've had the process of the examiner giving you samples of a chart and something he's inserting different lenses, he or she, and they ask, is this better or is this better? And on to the next one, is this better or is this better? And sometimes you just don't know, you're not sure. They seem about the same it's hard to know for sure. Maybe we're a little anxious because we think, well, I say the wrong thing here and I don't get as good of glasses for me. That process reminds me of what Paul writes when he says, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. The Apostle Paul is praying that we in our spiritual lives may discern what is best because we need such prayers because just as in an eye exam we're often not sure is it that one better or is that one better we end up with decisions that we need to make and we're not sure which is better. Sometimes we're not even sure which is right, which is the godly good decision, which is the decision God would rather have us not make. So we ask for Christ-corrected and Christ-guided vision to discern what is best, to do what is right, and to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Far-sightedness keeps looking ahead to our eternity. It keeps recognizing that we're not just bodies, we are also souls. In this life, when we use the expression, I can't wait until this or that day, it's often describing the day of a wedding or the day of a certain big party or the day of a graduation or the day of retirement. Christ-corrected vision has us also especially looking forward to the day of Christ Jesus. Christ-corrected vision looks ahead eagerly to his day, this last day. We say with the scripture writers, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We recognize that for a child of God, the Day of our death in this world could easily be described, I'm not going to rank them first and second, but we could say the day of our death is one of the two best days in our lives. The other one being our baptism or coming to faith, becoming a child of God. It's hard to top that, but right there with that is the day of our death which brings us 
into the presence of God. And Paul points us into eternity a bit when he speaks of these things taking place to the glory and praise of God. The descriptions God give, gives us of being in his presence for now are frequently ex having us exclaim glory and praise to our God because we will see so clearly, so much more clearly how wonderful and gracious and great our Lord has been to us. Give us that kind of Christ-corrected vision also so we can be nearsighted. The near we are talking about here and that the Apostle Paul is talking about is in the sense of when we speak of our near and dear ones. People whom we love. People who are close to our hearts. We, we care about them. And do we ever hear that as Paul writes to these Philippian Christians? I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. These Philippians were near and dear to the Apostle Paul. Christ had given him the vision to treasure them and pray for them always with joy, every one of them. And we might think, well, these Philippians were certainly an extraordinary bunch then that Paul could love them so much. We might think it's safe to say that they must have never been cranky. They must have never been lazy. They must have never been bossy. I'm sure they weren't ever in trouble with the law. They must have never said things that they later regretted and though it's going on in their hearts it's safe to say they didn't have any lusts or jealousies or lingering resentments or thoughts of revenge and of course it's not safe to say that because they were all sinners and certainly all of those things were true of any number of them any number of times it's not because of how they were and what they were that he loved them so. They were weak, wandering, stumbling sinners just as we are. But Paul was seeing them with Christ-corrected vision. He saw those foul, wretched sinners as fragrant, beautiful, perfect people of God because he knew that that was exactly how his Savior was seeing them. And that is exactly how God is seeing us. In another letter, Paul wrote, God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself, which means making this sinful world match with him, lining up the two things, not by making himself bad, but by declaring the world good. The sinless, holy God, he took this messed up, wicked world and scrubbed it clean in his holy son's blood. And we are to be conscious of that as we consider people. Consider certainly that we are as helpless and hopeless to win God's favor as anyone else is, but also always considering that God has had mercy on all of us. In our sinful weakness, we so often physically look at one another with our uncorrected vision, with our unspiritual vision and we let thoughts of the physical dominate what we think about when we see other people we 
we consider, are they attractive or unattractive? Are they the right weight or are they the wrong weight? Are they weak and disabled or are they strong and, and fully abled? Christ-corrected vision sees anyone in any sort of condition, first of all, as someone for whom the Son of God lived and suffered and died and rose again. Let us strive to see other people, to see them as nearer and dearer to us because we can see them, anyone, as someone whom God has declared forgiven. Paul has a prayer for helping us get over the foolishness of regarding people too much just by physical sight. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. To help us do that, let's take another example from the world of physical eye exams. The doctors are striving to get us to the point where we have what they call 2020 vision. The great physician, our Savior Jesus, wants us to have plenty, plenty vision. And what I mean by that, he wants us to see that we have plenty of sins, plenty of faults, plenty of things that leave us, would have left us out of God's favor forever. But God also wants us to see that he is there with plenty of forgiveness for our plenteous sins. Christ corrects our vision to see the plenteousness of his mercy. And that's the encouragement to keep going on and loving others and seeing them and loving them and forgiving them as we have been seen and loved and forgiven by our Savior. At the beginning, we spoke of those wondrous marvels of corrected vision that God has given us to improve our physical sight. Some of you may have heard and may have seen the new technology that is allowing certain people who previously could not see color, their world was just black and white, through computer chips and other things, they are rigging up things so that people who had that condition are now seen in color for the first time. And like billions of other things, video of people seeing color for the first time is available on YouTube. It's, I'd recommend seeing it. It's a wondrous thing. People laughing for joy, people weeping for joy, their knees growing weak, reaching for somewhere to sit down because they can't believe the wondrous world that they are seeing. Maybe this is a bit of a picture of heaven. When we see our Lord face to face, when we are for the first time not walking by faith as we do now, but walking by sight. For now, God lets us see as much as we need to see for our soul's salvation. He lets us see his cross. He lets us see his empty tomb where he rose from the grave. He lets us see and read and treasure his promises. But then we will see him face to face. And then we will more fully know and understand his goodness and grace to us. And our vision will be eternally corrected by Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding will keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Eternal Father, throughout the centuries you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take heart the words of John. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical and emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. Move us to pray for these brothers and sisters and to help when we can. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We close with the hymn.
Once again, it is a good and blessed thing to prepare with you for the coming of our Savior. Looking ahead all the way until Christmas, we have Christmas Eve services at 6.30, Christmas Day, 9 a.m., here at St. Matthew Lutheran Church, 8444 West Melvina in Milwaukee. Those times are the same on every Sunday morning. It's a 9 o'clock service. Every Monday evening, a 6.30 service. God be with you and yours until we meet again. <laughs>